Here we go. I want to preach to you. I, I believe God gave me this message, man, I mean like weeks ago. It started out with just one point. It developed. If you need one, put your hand up, Nancy, and make sure you get it. Uh, it started out with one point. It uh, evolved, if I could say that word in church. It evolved into five points. And so this, this is what it is. Five things to make in 2020 better than 2019. Can you say amen? Five things that you must embrace. Yeah, it takes your participation. Five things that you must embrace if you want to make 2020 100% better than 2019. Pastor, how can you guarantee 100%? Because it's the word of God, that's how. I can never guarantee 100%, but the God can. So, uh, I had this uh, example. You know, in the Bible, Elijah and Elisha, two great prophets, right? Back in the Old Testament. Elijah came first. The easiest way to remember is Elijah, J comes before Elisha, S. So Elijah was first, and then Elisha. I don't know if you're like me, you got to have visuals like that. And so it came to time that Elisha had been serving Elijah for eight years. And the time came when Elijah was going to be taken from the earth. And not only did Elisha know it, everybody in the region knew it. Everywhere they went, uh, people would say, do you not know that this is the day the Lord's going to come and take Elijah from you? And Elisha would say, yes, I know. Hold your peace. And so they were like glue, man. They were going together. Elisha's like, I don't want to miss this. And, and Elisha, remember, he's eight years in the shadows of Elijah. And his whole ministry that we know from the Bible, he's pouring water on the prophet's hands. He's ministering to Elijah. He's not doing any miracles. He's just around the miraculous. He's around a man like Elijah. And it's good, it's, it's important who you associate with because that will help give you a hunger for the things of God if who you're with has a hunger for the things of God. Amen, isn't that true? You can hang around all your deadbeat friends and they're gonna do nothing but pull you down. Man, no, I want to hang around some people like Elijah that they just want to keep persevering in God so when I do hang around my deadbeat friends, I can be of use to them. Amen? I can pull them up instead of them pulling me down. <laughs> Excuse me. So it came time <clears throat> when God was going to take up Elijah. If you get one, put it right here, dear. I appreciate it. And, um, and so Elijah finally sees the tenacity and the faithfulness of Elisha. And he says, what do you want? What is it you want of me? He said, ask anything you want before I'm taken away. And Elisha said, I want a double portion of what you have. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken up, it'll be granted. And brother, don't you know that day, there's no way Elisha is leaving. And so sure enough, the time came, the chariot of fire came, and it split the two. Read it in your Bibles. It split the two asunder, and Elijah went up in a whirlwind of fire in the heaven. And Elisha said, I see you. And Elijah dropped the mantle. Now, this is why I'm telling you this. is because I said there are five things you need to embrace. You have to participate. The blessings of God don't just fall on you like ripe apples off a tree. No, you got to pick it up by faith. you got to embrace it. And so the, the mantle falls, and it didn't fall on Elisha. It fell on the ground. And Elisha went over and picked it up by faith and split the river Jordan. Now, that's what you got to do. Amen? you got to be hungry for the things of God. You've got to be thirsty for the things of God. And you've got to already know Jesus wants to give you his blessings. He wants to give you his gifts more sometimes than we want to receive it. I mean, how many of you for, for a lot of years said no to the gift of salvation? You do know it's a gift. And yet God tried to get it to you and God tried to give you salvation and you, no, 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 no. And finally something happened, maybe a tragedy or maybe uh, you just uh, allowed the Holy Spirit to open your eye and you saw, man, I need Jesus. And so he is the giver of gifts. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. And he has more than one gift. Salvation is a gift. There are other gifts that God wants to give us. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6. 
And I want to get there real quick. And so the first, I, I didn't write the word embrace. That didn't come to me till last night in prayer. So if you would, before every one of those five points, if you write the word embrace, the power of, write the word embrace before that, that'll be good. So the first one is, and, and these are all fundamental. Sometimes we forget the fundamentals. You need, listen, if you want 2020 to be greater than 2019, I want to encourage you to embrace the power of prayer. That's right, prayer. You know, when a person is backsliding, when they're drifting away from the Lord, you can tell because the first thing, always the first thing that will go is their prayer life. Because you don't want to talk to a God who's going to try to straighten you out. And I'll guarantee you, first thing to go will be your prayer life. Then, then, then it'll be your Bible reading. Then it'll be your, your offerings and your tithing. But the first thing to go will be your prayer life. That's where the devil hits you the hardest. Why? Because it's so powerful. You need to embrace the power of prayer. And too many of us, we, we, we don't persevere in prayer. We don't have tenacity in prayer. And we kind of, some of us kind of treat God like some cosmic bellhop. And when he doesn't answer our beck and call, we get discouraged and we call that prayer. That's not prayer. Jesus, hear this, Jesus, when it comes to prayer, Jesus is the authority on it. Can we all say amen? amen. And over the last 2,000 years, his teachings on prayer have produced world shakers for his kingdom. I'm talking about women like, 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 uh, uh, oh gosh, and I can't even think of her name. Elizabeth Elliot. I'm talking about men like John Wesley. Charles Finney. Hey man, uh, I'm talking, I got to get his name, George Mueller, who ran that orphanage. Never asked anybody for money. He would, it would come a time, George Mueller had all these orphans. And it, they had no food in the house. And jo read it in his book, George Mueller is what it's called. And they would set the table. He'd tell his little orphan boys, set the table. They would set the table with the dishes and the silverware and the napkins. They had no food in the pantry. They would sit there. Sometimes they would all sit at the table and he'd say, let's pray. And as he prayed, there'd be a knock on the door. I kid you not. And somebody had brought some groceries. Somebody had brought a meal. You want to increase your faith in prayer? Buy the book, George Mueller, read it. I mean, next to the Bible, it's pretty good. But Jesus, it's interesting in, in Matthew 6 that when Jesus begins his teachings on prayer, he begins by teaching the people how not to pray. There's lots of people, they don't know how to pray. Isn't that funny? I mean, if we were there, we would have said, Jesus, that's kind of negative. I mean, so let's just read it in verse 5 of Matthew 6. He says, and when you pray, you will not be as the hypocrites are. Well, that's kind of judgmental. I mean, those poor hypocrites, Jesus picking on them. That's not very uh, nice in our culture nowadays. They would be so offended. You'd get put in the Facebook jail if you did that. When you pray, don't be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Truly, I say unto you, they've got their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. Now, what's your closet? Now, I know some people literally have taken their clothes and their shoes out of their home closet and made their shoe closet a prayer closet, and that's okay. Some people, it's their basement. Some people, it's their bedroom. Uh, but you, did you know I don't need a special room to enter into my closet? I could be sitting at Panera, hey amen, having a coffee and having one of those egg things they got, and I got to quit because I'm getting hungry right now. And all of a sudden, the Lord could drop in my heart Eli's name and, and say, I want you to pray for Eli and his wife, Brianne. And right there, I could just bow my head, not making a nuisance, not, oh, God. 
But I could just bow my head right there. Lord Jesus, I lift up Eli and Brianne. And Lord, I pray that you bless them, you prosper them, you protect them. My prayer closet is where I meet with God. So he said, enter into your closet. Not, not a spectacle. Not, he just said that. Don't be like the hypocrite. Chris, don't you dare pray to be seen of men. He said, but enter in your closet and your father which seeth in secret. He said, shut the door. What's that mean, shut the door? Shut out all distraction. All, all voices, all, all doubts, shut it all out. Get in that prayer closet. Put the word of God in front of you and shut everything out and go into prayer. <coughs> He said, and pray to your father, which is in secret, and your father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. But when you pray, notice verse 7 is coming before uh, verse 9. He said, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Do not use prayer like a mantra. Don't say the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over, thinking you'll be heard for your much speaking. Now, <laughs> there's many times, excuse me, there's many times I pray for the same thing, and I'm going to until I see an answer. Amen? But it'll be different times. I say, Lord, I'm bringing this up to you again. He's not talking about that. He's talking about using some kind of mantra, using, well, like people do with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do you don't even know what they said? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and will be done. Thinking they'll be heard. He said, don't do that. Do not use vain repetition. As the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Verse 8, do not be like unto them. Your father already knows what things you have need of before you ask him, but he still wants you to ask him. I know the people are like, oh, God knows what I need. Yeah, he does. Jesus just said that. But then the next thing Jesus said, after this manner, therefore pray. He didn't say, don't worry, you don't have to pray because God knows. But he says, after this manner. Now, what's he going to teach us? He's going to teach us how to pray. He's not telling you what to pray. He's teaching you how to pray. After this manner, after this example, after this pattern, therefore, pray ye. And the first thing he says to do is say, our Father. I like it that he didn't just say, my Father. He said, our Father. Why? We are the family of God. Yeah, we may have some weird-looking brothers and sisters, but we are all family. I might be your weird cousin from Florida, but I'm still in the family of God. Amen. So he said, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or he says, you, you know, there's an approach to God. We are, God dictates, God tells us, God shows us and God commands us how we are to approach him. And it's not because he's glory hungry. No, it's because he's God, he's the creator, and he is worthy. And, and we show respect to him. God's not the big daddy. Jesus is not, you know, the, uh, 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 hey, hey, big dog in the sky. No, 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 he's Jesus. God's our father. And God said, if you want to approach me right, you need to approach me with worship. You need to approach me with prayer. Not that he needs it, because he doesn't. He was around long before any of us were. Some people say, well, God made us to, to worship him. No, he didn't. Well, God made us uh, to love him. No, he didn't. He was fine without us. He made us because he loves us. So he tells us. He says that if you want to approach me, what's it say in Psalms? I'll enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, I will enter his courts with praise. I will be thankful unto him, and I'll bless his holy name. Did you do that when you came in today? Or did you come in like, I didn't get what I wanted for Christmas. Man, the weather's bad outside. No, no, no. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Can you find something to be thankful for? How about you woke up this morning? I was listening to, to Zig Ziglar when I was down. Zig Ziglar's a pretty positive dude. He's a Christian. Or he was. He's dead. He's in heaven. And he said, you, you know, he, he's, people ask him, how can you say every morning's a good morning? He said, well, try not waking up. I mean, I woke up with some pain after surgery, but I woke up. Oh, yeah. All right. So let's go on. This is why I never got through all five points first sermon. 
Remember in Mark 15, there was a Syrophoenician woman. She's not a Jew. She's Syrophoenician, and she has a daughter who's possessed by a devil. That's what it says, Matthew 15. And she sees Jesus and his disciples walking by. And the Bible says, your Bible, my Bible says that she went to Jesus and she said, she approached him as he's walking and she said, have mercy on me, O Lord. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And Jesus, Mr. Compassion, ignored her. Read it in your Bible. The Bible says he answered her not a word. So she started crying after the disciples. And then they, in turn, come crying after Jesus. And they said, Jesus, send her away. Now she's crying after us. He said, I'm not sent, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then, if you ever go to that story in Matthew 15, or when you go there, take a pencil and write second approach. Even though she's not a member of the household of faith, even though she's not a Jew, even though she's cut off from the covenants of Israel, she comes and she worships him. And she says the same thing after she worshiped. Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is vexed with the devil. And she got her answer. So when we come before God with a heavy heart, many, many times, with brokenness, even in our brokenness, Father, I praise you for who you are. Father, I enter into your presence thanking you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are God. You are holy. You are just. You are love. I thank you for your compassion. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. And Lord, you already know, but you told me to say it anyway. My heart's heavy. And then you pray to him. Now, this is the other thing he said. The second thing, verse 10. We are to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How do you know the will of God? Not a trick question and don't answer out loud because you might be wrong, but I don't think so. How do you know the will of God? Well, it's right here. Sitting in your lap or on your phone or on your tablet or whatever you got, if it's got the Bible, you've got the will of God. God's word is his will. God's will is his word. God doesn't say one thing and will another. He doesn't will one thing and say another. This Jesus is telling us, you need to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He said you need to find the will of God. What does God say about your marriage? What does God say about your wayward children? What does God say about your situation you're in at work? What does God say about these situations, these circumstances? Find it in the word and maybe it's about your finances and then pray it back to him. Father, you said in your word that you would blah, 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 blah. It's not that he's old like me and forgets. No, but he said in Isaiah, put me in remembrance. So we remind him. We come to him. I remember it was Charles Finney. I read this once and I thought, of course, I was a new Christian back then. And I was like, wow, that's, I don't know about that. But Charles Finney in his boldness and his reverency for God. He would come and he would hold the Bible up and he'd say, God, I hold your faithful word in my hand, your faithful promise, and I will not be denied. And you know, God didn't frown on him for doing that. No, God was honored to find a man, to find a woman who will take him at his word. Amen? You say, well, pastor, you... You had to have hip surgery. Yeah, I didn't. I couldn't stand on his word for him to give me a hip, but I stood on his word for the doctor to give me a hip. You may say, well, yeah, weak faith. Well, I probably do in that area. Amen. Pray for me. But I believe that I, everything would be all right. And in a few months, I'll jump up on that platform like uh, Kirby does. Of course, my foot will probably catch. And Anyway. Find out what God says in his word, what he promises. Stand on that word. Pray that word out. Amen? So let's go on. I'm talking about you need to embrace the power of prayer because some of you are discouraged. Things didn't happen like you wanted to. Things didn't go like you prayed about. 
And of course, it's the devil to just discourage you to where you throw the, all your prayer life out the window and say, no, God's unfaithful. He goes on to say this, uh, give us this day our daily bread. He's concerned about your needs. He wants you to pray about your daily needs. He loves you. Can you believe that? And, and he said, and then the next one, we'll look at verse 12. Forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive those who have sinned, trespassed against us. Let me ask you this. Do you really want God to forgive you as you've forgiven others? See, because I know a handful of Christians, they refuse to forgive. I know a handful of Christians where they'll demand it's their right not to forgive. I know a handful of Christians where they'll believe that they have every right to hold on to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. And pastor, you don't know what they did to me. So here, would you pray? And Lord, forgive me as I forgive others. Now, many of us in here, we could pray that. Because we've forgiven everybody and anybody who's ever hurt us, harmed us, said anything against us, done anything to us. We forgave them. Because the love of God's in us, not because we wanted to, not because they deserved it. We forgave them because we're submitted to Jesus Christ. And we want to honor him. All right? And then he says, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. He ends it with, with, with praise. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Luke 18, 1, don't turn there, just write it down. In Luke 18, 1. Jesus said, men ought all, and when he says men, he means men and women. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, which tells me that there's a tendency to faint when it comes to the believing in the power of prayer. There's a tendency that where do you always faint at first in your mind? The mind's the battlefield. That's why Paul and Peter and all those apostles talked about you need to renew your mind. Peter said you need to prepare your mind for battle. You need to brace up the loins of your mind. With what? With the word of God. With his faithfulness. With the character of God. Knowing that God is God and he will do what he said he will do. Okay? So the first place we faint is in our mind. Now the word faint, man, I looked it up. This is beautiful. He said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Faint, the definition of faint is lacking brightness, lacking vividness, lacking clearness. In other words, you begin to lose sight of the power of prayer. You begin to faint. It also means to lose consciousness or not be aware of its power. In the Amplified Bible in James chapter 5, when James was writing about prayer, he said the effectual, fervent, heartfelt, continued. Everybody say continued. Amen. Prayer of a righteous person makes tremendous power available that is dynamic in its working. That's good. That's the Amplified. That's why I don't memorize from that. Although I did memorize that. But anyway. Don't underestimate the power of believing prayer. Listen to me. Mary, the Queen of Scots, in the 16th century, she's recorded as saying, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of, it, of, of Europe. She said, I could care less about those armies, but when John Knox goes to praying, I don't know how many times he was put in prison. Number two, as far as we're going to get. Go to Acts chapter 2, please. Who can guess where I'm going with Acts chapter 2? How many charismatics in the house? I want you to embrace. If you want to make 2020 100% better than 2019, besides embracing the power of prayer, I encourage you to embrace the power of the gift of the infilling of the Holy Ghost that you can find in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, 1 Corinthians 14. You can hear Jesus preach about it in John chapter 7, John chapter 13, John chapter 14, John chapter 16. 
Oh yeah, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, I know I know, I got some naysayers here this morning. I know I got some people that you were taught that that died out with the last apostle. Then that doesn't explain 30 years later in Acts chapter 19 when Paul comes upon some men. They're not apostles. They're just believers, and they all get filled, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, 10 days after the ascension of Jesus up into heaven. Before he ascended, he told over 500 people, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to tarry, that means to wait, for the promise of my Father which you have heard from me. And there again, if you read John chapter 7, John chapter 13, John chapter 14, John chapter 16, they all knew he was talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to go, I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to send the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, same person. Amen. Please turn your cell phones off. So, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, and the they, we don't have time, you can read chapter 1, 120 out of that 500 obeyed Jesus, and they met in an upper room for 10 days. And they're studying the scriptures, and they're praying, and they, they got in unity. And it wasn't just the 11 apostles, because you remember Judas went and hung himself, but it was some other disciple. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was also there. Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven demons out, she was there. There was some other women named Mary, because that was a popular name back then, amen. They were in that room. So it wasn't just men. It was men and women and the four brothers, or how should I say half-brothers of Jesus, whom the Bible mentions by name, they were there. They are the ones who didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah till after he was raised from the dead, but now they're in that upper room. And 10 days later, verse 1 of chapter 2 happens. And in verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto all 120 split, split tongues, cloven tongues. That was cloven means split, as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. Pastor, what do you think that is? I remember Paul preaching in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. Or better put, though I speak in an earthly language and a heavenly language. Yet if I don't have love, I'm nothing. I've met some of those spirit-filled Christians that don't have much love. They've got nothing. Anyway, let's get back to this. That's a whole other sermon. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. It sat upon, well, look at this, each of them, all 120, had this flame above their head. Now, it's never been repeated like that. And they, the 120, they were all filled, Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast out seven devils, the other Mary, the other women, they were all filled, Jesus' four half-brothers, with the Holy Ghost, and they all began to speak. They didn't think. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now hear me this. Uh, there's lots of teachings been going on, weird teachings forever and a day about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And some people think the more weirder they are, the more holier they are. And that's not true. We'll get to that in a minute. But when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, which is subsequent to salvation, there's a whole sect, sect of people who believe uh, unscripturally that if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues, you're not even a Christian. And they get that from taking a scripture out of Acts 2.38. Repent, therefore, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But I can show you in the Bible, Paul the Apostle was saved first and then three days later got filled with the Holy Ghost. I can show you in the Bible in Acts chapter 19 where the 12 uh, of John's disciples became 12 of Jesus' disciples. And then after they were baptized in the name of Jesus, then Paul laid his hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. 
I can show you in Acts chapter 8 where Philip went down to Samaria and preached unto them Christ and they were saved and there was great joy in that city and when the church in Jerusalem who happened to be run by Pastor James who was Jesus' half brother who didn't believe in him till the resurrection when James and the church heard the news that Samaria had received the word of God through Philip's preaching they sent Peter and John down there not that they would preach Christ to them but that they would preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues I'm telling you God still saves today and I'm telling you God still salvation is a gift and God still gives the gift of the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues because the prayer language the utterance comes with the Holy Ghost now, men have gotten into this, and they said, you know, you can be filled and, 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 uh, and, and uh, get to your tongues later. Uh, that's not biblical. Well, pastor, I know somebody, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. They don't speak in tongues. And I would say, why not? It's not that they don't have the ability to. If they're really filled with the Holy Ghost, that utterance is there according to the Bible. There's no such thing as the gift of the infilling of the Holy Ghost and then the gift of speaking in tongues in your private prayer life. Although we all know all those are gifts, but I mean, there's no separate. Just like when you received Christ, you received eternal life. Is that right? Is that what the Bible says? It's not that you received Christ and then God said, yeah, you got Christ. Let's see if you walk it out and then I'll give you eternal life. No, because Jesus is life. And the gifts of the Holy Ghost, guess what? They come with the Holy Ghost. The gift of salvation was by Jesus. Can I get an amen there? And I don't know why people want to muddy the waters and make it difficult. So, uh, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues. Now, this is what, this is what I love. F first, let me say this. I want you to know that the Holy Ghost is not a force. The Holy Ghost is not an energy source. The Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit is a person. And he's the third person of the Godhead. And when the Holy Ghost came down on those 120 men and women, the Bible says, pick it up in verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Yeah, they were there for a festival. And when this was noised abroad, the Amplified says, when they heard the noise of 120 people speaking in other tongues, they came together and it drew their attention. Now listen, they weren't like, I mean, they were going for it. They were worshiping God in other tongues. I don't know if they were in the street. I don't know if they were still in the upper room. But wherever they were, the people on the outside heard them. And that's what your Bible says. And let's read it. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded. Well, Pastor Mike, I thought God's not the author of confusion. No, not to the believer. But there are believers that mock salvation. There are unbelievers that mock salvation. There are unbelievers that mock praying in the Spirit. There are unbelievers that will mock the way you worship today, even though it's all through the Psalms. They were confounded because every man heard the 120 speak in the language they were born in. And they were all amazed and they were all marveled, but nobody got saved. And they said one to another, are not all these people here Galileans? Aren't they second-class citizens? How do we hear every one of them speak in our own tongue where we were born? Then they make a list of who, and then drop down to verse 11. They said, we do hear them. Watch this. Speak in our tongues. Not a bunch of devil stuff. Not a bunch of babbling and nonsense. We do hear them speak the wonderful works of God. While they're worshiping God in tongues. We have no record that the 120 knew anything what they were saying. We only knew, knew we have record that God allowed the people in the, in the public to be able to interpret what they were saying. You never see Peter saying, oh yeah, I was speaking Russian, I knew it. I was speaking Swahili. No, you don't see that. But those people that may have been from those areas, they understood it. 
So Lord says, and they were all, verse 12, they're all amazed. And they're in doubt. And they said one to another, what means this? And others, now get this, especially you wild, crazy, charismatics. Get this verse 13. Others mocking said, these people are drunk. Why did they say they're drunk? It wasn't because they're doing this. Like some people think, if I do this and I speak in tongues, I'm real spiritual. No, you're an idiot. You never saw Jesus do that. You never saw any of the apostles. It's never recorded where Peter wanted to pray for somebody, but he couldn't because he was bucking. I'm getting dizzy just doing that. No, God's a God of order. I'm telling you, the doctrines of men have come in, and we've made it whereas if I get, the goofier I get, the more spiritual I am. No, you're just goofy. And that's why people avoid you. And that's why you can't, your witness carries nothing, no weight. Now, Pastor Mike can't, yeah, God can do whatever he wants. I'm not, a, I, God knocked Paul slapped down to the ground by a bright light. How many read that in your Bible? God put Peter in a trance at noon, but God did it. Not man trying to bring attention to themselves. Ah, here we go. Half of you won't be back next week. That's all right. <laughs> Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. When Peter heard, heard that, watch this. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. I'm, I'm glad Peter wasn't so drunk that he couldn't preach. Yes, it irritates the fire out of me. Yeah, it does. No, when Peter heard that accusation, he said, hey, wait a minute, fellas. He said, no, you got it all wrong. These men are not drunken as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Read it in your Bible. And he, and he, he brings up, that's right, the word of God. Verse 17, and Joel said, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. The last days. Well, the last days began at the day of Pentecost. The Bible says a thousand years is with the Lord as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. Joel said in the last days, plural, there's at least 2,000. There's at least two days. I believe there's three days. That's just personal belief, though. You can believe whatever you want. Remember when Adam and Eve, when God said, don't eat of that fruit, the day that you eat, you'll die. Well, she ate and he ate. They died spiritually, we know that, but they didn't die physically. Adam lived to be, what, 936 years old? But if a day with the Lord's as a thousand years, nobody from that time has lived a day. No one's lived a thousand years. The closest was Methuselah, 969 years. God said, the day you eat, you'll die. In the last days, we're living in the last days. If the last days began at Pentecost, we're still in the last days. For God, it's only been two days if a thousand years is with the Lord as a day. And a day is a thousand years. Can I get an agreement on that? So he said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Not just crazy charismatics. Methodists, Catholics, Baptists, Lutherans. Brethren, Congregationalists. God, I remember, I lived through the 60s and 70s. I lived through the Jesus movement. I lived through God knocking down denominational barriers and baptizing people in the Holy Ghost. Didn't even ask for it. Baptists would go to these charismatic meetings like, well, I'm a Baptist. I don't agree with none of this stuff, but I'll go because you're my friend. Sit there with a skull on, skull on their face and their arms like this, and next thing you know, they're laying on the floor speaking in tongues because God baptized them. Now, that's not the norm. That's the exception. That's a Paul the Apostle experience. Because how many of you in here, you got saved while you were, God knocked you down by a bright light and appeared to you? Anybody? But that's how Paul got saved. So that's not the norm. But he's God. He can do whatever he wants. Can you, too many of you, of you, you put God in a box. Well, guess what? God's not charismatic. Guess what? God's not fundamentalist either. God's supernatural. 
He's God. He can do whatever he wants with whomever he wants because he's a creator and we're the creation. But let's not take a, a, a one-time experience and try to make a doctrine out of it because it, it, it doesn't work. God said, upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. They'll speak the anointed word of God. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days, plural, of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I said that to say this, and I'm, I'm starting to wind, wind up. Don't let some unbelieving Christian or the devil try and convince you that the gift of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is not for you or not for today. I already showed you the day of Pentecost, they got saved filled at the same time. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, he was the, the first Gentile that Peter was sent to. Remember Acts chapter 10? He was a Greek. The word Greek means Gentile. And Peter goes to him uh, because the Lord showed Peter a, a vision and said, three men are going to come get you. Go with them. Cornelius has prayed, and uh, I'm going to bless him. And so Peter gets to Cornelius' house. I don't know how many was in his family. I don't know how many servants he had. But the Bible says when Peter began to preach about the forgiveness of Christ, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them that heard the word, and they were all saved and filled with the Holy Ghost at the same time. And Peter knew that because he heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. But 30 years after Paul's conversion, 30 years down the road in Acts 19, Paul happens to come upon 12 men that he believes are disciples of Jesus. And the first question he asked them, believing that they are Christians, is, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, in our day, they'd have said, well, yeah, Paul, man, I got the Holy Ghost when I got saved. And you're right, you did. It's the Holy Ghost who did the work, of the, the, the work of the new birth in you. How many know that? If you have not the Spirit of the Lord, you're none of His, what it says in Romans. But there's a difference between the Holy Spirit at present at the work of salvation and the gift of the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues. You don't need the latter to get to heaven. Wasn't the Holy Ghost died on the cross was Jesus. Wasn't the Holy Ghost shed His blood was Jesus. Wasn't the Holy Ghost buried in that tomb and raised from the dead? No, that was Jesus. But don't drive a stake in the ground and say the gift of salvation is the only gift God has for me. Oh, no, he has many gifts. And you can tell, yeah, this is a Holy Ghost church. Make no apologies about it. All the 120 in Acts chapter 2, 1 and 2, all of them got filled. Not 118, not everybody but Mary Magdalene who was possessed with seven devils. Not everybody but Jesus' four half-brothers who didn't believe on him until after he was raised. No, all 120. All of Cornelius' household in Acts chapter 10 and his servants, all of them who heard Peter preach, got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. All 12 of the men in Acts chapter 19... Peter's, or Paul's preaching to them. And he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we ain't even heard there be a Holy Ghost. I said, there must have been Methodist. Amen. <laughs> Just kidding. Wesley, would you come, please? They said, we hadn't even heard there be a Holy Ghost. And, and, and Paul says, well, why, what baptism were you baptized with? They said, the baptism of John, John the Baptist, who baptized a uh, baptism of repentance. Remember? And so Paul tells them, well, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying that they should believe on him who should come. That is Christ Jesus. So Paul preaches Jesus to them. They believe on Jesus, and they're baptized in water. Then Paul lays his hands on them. Read it in Acts chapter 19. And they're all, someone say all. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost. How do we know? Because it says they begin to speak in tongues and magnify God. Three more points that we'll get with next week. But let me say this. Why is this Holy Ghost language? Because remember, I, I put these two together. Prayer and the infilling of the Holy Ghost because they're so closely associated. Why is this Holy Ghost language so important 
to your prayer life. Now you got to hear this. We know how to pray. Jesus taught us how to pray. Jesus taught us. We enter God's presence. We were, we, Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name. We know to say, Father, in the name of Jesus. We know to use the word of God. So we know how to pray. Now hear this. But we don't always know what to pray. And your Bible, the one on your phone or your tablet, the one you have on your lap, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, Paul says, If I speak in an unknown tongue. Now, he's, he's talking about tongues in your private prayer. To, you're not talking about tongues in church and someone yelling out a tongue and everybody looks at them weird. Not talking about that. Talking about in your private devotion, in your prayer time, in your worship. Paul said this, if I speak in an unknown tongue, I speak not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands me. Howbeit in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now see, that don't make sense to you. Remember, the Bible interprets itself. The Bible's not of any private interpretation. We've tried that us preachers and we've really messed it up so Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 2 he's speaking not unto man but unto God no man understands him how be it in the spirit he speaks mysteries then I go to Acts chapter 2 and I go let me just turn to it Acts chapter 2 or excuse me 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and I read down in verse 7 and Paul's talking about I didn't come to you with the Words of wisdom of man's invention. I came to you in the power of the Spirit, right? Then he says in verse 7, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now let's put those two verses together. No man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit, when he's praying in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, he's speaking mysteries. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, Paul says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. You know what this tells me? What this tells me when I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying the wisdom of God, which is a lot greater than my wisdom. When I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying the will of God. Last ver verse, and I'll show you that one to you. At, uh, Romans chapter 8. Hopefully you're writing these down. Verse 26. Well, all through chapter 8, Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit. He bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. He's talking about sufferings. He's talking about how the Holy Spirit helps us. And then in verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Now, many times when you and I think of infirmity, we think sickness, we think disease, and that is part of the definition of infirmity. But infirmity also means weakness, frailty, shortcomings. And so he says, likewise, the Spirit also helps our weakness, our frailties, our shortcomings. And he says it right here. We do, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We know how. But he said there are times you don't know what to pray. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Now who's he making intercession before? Well, it ain't the devil. He's making intercession for us to God. Watch this. He makes intercession uh, for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts, that's God the Father, he knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Let's say I'm, uh, I'm in my prayer time. Paul said, I, I will pray with my understanding. And I will also pray in the spirit. He said, I'm going to pray in English or whatever language he spoke. A known language. And I'm going to pray in my unknown language. So let's say I'm here praying. It's Saturday night. And the Lord lays Andrew and Joanne on my heart. And the Lord just says, Pastor, I want you to pray for Andrew and Joanne. I just feel that. Y'all have had a burden before. You know what that's like. Sometimes it just comes out of nowhere. I say, Lord, I lift up Andrew and Joanne. God, I pray for their finances. I pray you bless them. I know they're struggling right now. 
Father, I pray that, that you prosper them, Lord. I pray that they prosper and be in health, Third John 2, even as their soul prospers. Father, I pray for their relationship. I pray for their marriage, and I can pray like that. Now, let's say I get done, or I'm towards the end of praying, Dan. And it's like God's like, that's good. You just kind of feel like you're not done. I can say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to lift up Andrew and Joanne. I want to pray for them in the spirit. I want to pray for them in tongues. And I just go to pray for them in the spirit. I just begin speaking my prayer language to God. While I'm speaking that to God, my Bible tells me in Romans 8, I'm praying the will of God. I'm praying the wisdom of God. And I can pray for them in the spirit, in tongues, for five minutes, ten minutes, for two hours if I could take it. And I told you this, in 1980, this is where, I'll give you one example. 1980, when my wife was in the hospital, 11 weeks early, going to give birth, or they're going to rip John out of her womb, John, our second son. We didn't even know if it was a boy or girl. All we knew is you're, she had blood pressure 236 over 160. The baby was getting the same blood pressure. The doctors already said there's possible mental and physical retardation, to which we jokingly say to this day, we know there's nothing physically wrong with him. Amen. That news in that hospital, the doctor told Cleo and I, we're going to have to deliver you of the baby today. 11 weeks early, 1980. That news hit me like a ton of bricks. What would you do? We didn't even have our own place. We had just gotten out of Bible school, and we were staying at a friend's house. We had a mattress on the floor underneath the basement stairs. That's where we were staying. But I had the key to the house, and I went into the house, and they were all gone to work, and there was nobody in the living room. Kids were at school. They were at work. I knew what to do, man. I opened my Bible up, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, what things wherever you desire. When you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. And I said, Heavenly Father, you know what we're facing. I lift up Cleo and that baby in that womb. Father, I pray that they live and not die. I pray that that baby develop normally in the name of you. And I begin to pray in tongues. And I prayed in tongues real hard and real fast. Not that that means anything, but, you know, when you're into it, you're into it. And I prayed in tongues real hard and real fast for like, Gosh, I got to close for like 50 minutes. And then all of a sudden I felt a weight lift. And then VJ, I know I wouldn't say your name, but I'm saying it. I knew everything's going to be all right. And I got to that hospital my wife had been praying to. I walked in that room like a half hour before they're going to deliver. I said, Cleo, everything's going to be all right. She said, I know it. And John was born two pounds, 11 ounces, dropped down to like two fours back in 1980. We didn't know this, but we got the report later, found out second or third day he began to deteriorate. We didn't know. We just kept praying. And now he's a prior Marine, went and served our nation in Fallujah. He'd be here today, but he's out of town. But I attribute that to thank God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gift if you want to know more about that, while I'm glad there's a pamphlet in some of those seat backs that says uh, the gift, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, take out home. In the meanwhile, if you, if you need Christ in your life, when I dismiss, I want you to come to me and say, Pastor, I need Jesus Christ in my life, and I'll pray with you. Or, Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Christ, and I'll pray with you. Let's stand to our feet. Sorry I went over. I went over one, two, three, four, seven, eight minutes. Please forgive me. I know that says 21, but that, that's not right. That's not right. I'm telling you, it's not right. It's a little trick we do. Anyway, Jesus, thank you for these people. Thank you for this new year coming up, Lord. I pray that every one of us, Lord, we look at it with anticipation and hope. Jesus, protect them as they go, Lord. It's supposed to rain, snow later. Let them drive their home safely. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you.